eastern Himalayas, nurturing an ancient region, an intermingling of traditions and faiths. It's one of India's lesser known regions, unexplored, remote and exotic for most. But times are changing. As a filmmaker, I have always wanted to explore the northeast of India. I'm here on a journey of discovery and exploration through India's misty mountains. Sikkim, washed over by India's highest peak, the Kanchanjunga, an ancient land its history dates back to the 8th century. Situated in the lap of the Himalayas, Sikkim shares its boundary with Bhutan, Tibet and Nepal. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, Kanchanzonga National Park is Sikkim's only national park, but it covers over 35% of its total land area. Yuxam, the first capital of Sikkim, is the gateway to Kanzanzonga and a short drive from Gangtok. I've been on the road for many weeks now and this feels like a good place to complete this incredible journey. Here in Yuxam, a community-based organization has worked over the past two decades to promote the area as an eco-tourism destination. Making sure the people here make a living through tourism, the local culture is preserved, and conservation of the environment becomes a natural outcome. It's uh, really humbling to be here yes, in one of the most ancient stupas in the country. And this is the origin of Buddhism in Sikkim. Very true, sir. I can see compassion all over. Yes, sir. How far is the culture and tradition dated back and how aware are people of the heritage, the responsibility of carrying it forward? The modern history of Sikkim started from here in Yoksam, exactly where here at a place called Narbogang. This is where the first king of Sikkim was consecrated in the year 1642. So the Yuksam in the native Lipta language means meeting place of the three learned one, you know, or the three great ones. Yuksam is a prime example of a perfect ecosystem. Yes, sir. Of community support, which has made it possible today, where ecotourism has managed to stabilize and create an equilibrium. And conservation, which the whole world is today talking about, has been successful. Yes, sir. So what has transformed the place? When we have to speak about Kanchenjunga, it's not just the mountain, it is also the garden deity of Sikkim. So people worship Kanchenjunga. And Kanchenjunga is the only mountain in the world which has this elaborate worshipping you know, uh, rituals. And since Kanchenjunga is the sacred mountain, the entire landscape starting from Yaksam to the Mount Kanchenjunga is considered as a sacred landscape. Conservation aspect of it, ecotourism aspect of it, could also be influenced somewhat through culturally also, because people uh, go there with a lot of respect uh, for the nature. It was basically when tourism started way back in 82, there were very few organized foreigners coming over here to do trekking. So the kind of impact that you get to see will be minimal. But then when it was opened up in 1992, the number of visitors coming over to the park started to increase tenfold, maybe more. We could see the kind of negative impact in the form of garbage accumulation or in the form of increase in the number of pack animals or in the form of uh, you know, heavy traffic up into the mountain. 
when we started way back in 1996, we were looking at these kind of negative impact through tourism having to our sacred landscape. Being local community, we felt that something has to be done. People from outside will not come to do it. You'll have to do it yourself. So I think culture has to play a part in it, you know, when you talk about the conservation. So if you go up there, every hill, every rock, every mountain, every lake is a secret. So we feel that, okay, tourism can bring in money, but not at the cost of destroying the nature. What, one of the things that really impressed me is the absence of commercial hotels and establishments and homestays which started in 2002 yes. have been perfected. And so there is participation by the community. Community then benefits yes. from the tourism that comes in here. Yes. Yes. So how do you manage this whole wide system? Right? We had this liberty of seeing other places being spoiled by tourism, where if you lease out hotel, how they're going to commercialize the entire places. Instantly you can benefit, but in the long run, you're going to lose. Homestay is one of the mechanism for benefit sharing of tourism income. But then we feel that if more and more people are in benefited out of tourism income, then there will be you know, one is the sharing of the income. The other thing could also mean like when people benefit from tourism sector, then it will lead to more conservation initiative. My name is Doma. I'm a homestay chalanga. My homestay name is Izom Homestay. Kesi se ne hamko training diya. Training ke baad un logon ne start kiya guest dene ke. Uh, first start, two jans start hua. Ham log ka sabhi ka training diya, cooking ka, housekeeping ka, safai kaisa karna hai, kaisa pakana hai, ha? guest ko kaisa interact karna hai. First guest aake kaisa un logo ka welcome karna hai. Wohi sab training diya hai. September, October, November ek season hai. Uh, ek hai March, April, May ka season hai. March, April, May ka season mein uh, jyada log trekking ke liye aata hai idhar. Uh, koi log bird watching ke liye, ko, koi flowering ke liye, koi meditation ke liye aata hai. Different, different ka aata hai. This is a very sustainable model. I think one of the most successful one across India. What's great is that income goes directly to the common man. Yes. And we need to support our, our people here. Firmly, it's my belief that conservation cannot be viewed in isolation. It's only when you bring in local communities and they become your partners, mm -hmm. then it's a win-win situation for everyone, and it's happening here. The whole world is talking about waste management today. And uh, here you have devised a plan and literally attained a zero waste situation. Zero waste initiative, what we have done is like once the garbages are here, it has been segregated into five, six different bins. So from there we also made a resource recovery center where these garbages are brought back to the recovery center, it cleaned and then segregated further so that we can recycle and reuse. So far this has helped to a great extent in managing garbage inside the National Park. Zero Waste Management is trying to solve waste management at the root itself. So we try to educate visitors visiting inside the National Park as well as the travel operator, as well as the uh, tourism stakeholders also, like porters, guide, cooks and travel agencies. So we came with a list uh, with the forest department saying that to make inventory list what are the food resources they are taking inside the National Park, which they have to declare like plastic, tins, YY, tata packs, kerosene, LPG, what they are taking. And uh, we also made an inventory saying that how much is coming back. So we requested park authorities to come with the notification. If they do not bring back the waste, which is from the Kanchanagar National Park, they can enforce fine till 5,000 rupees. And they can also cancel the license of respective travel agencies if they don't bring back.
This is the first kind of approach we have started. Now we have department, forest department is here. So the resource recovery center is uh, given by tourism department. And uh, legal uh, you know, monitoring is done by park authorities. And management of the waste is done by conservation committee. So basically like civil societies, private sector and department coming together. This is a unique project and 90% of the waste is coming back. In 2016, the Kanchenjunga National Park or Gochala Zongri Trek was declared as one of the cleanest destinations by New York Times. And Lonely Planet has uh, given recommendation that top 10 nature areas to visit. So that is the you know, outcome of our project. So internationally also, we have recognized and we, with this statement in Lonely Planet, New York Times has increased number of visitors. What a simple, straightforward way. I realized the rest of the country needs to learn and understand. This is a role model for everyone. And uh, I don't feel like leaving this place. Very and true. I think for every tourist that comes here, it will be a living experience Very true, of sir. what a perfect world is. Very true, sir. My compliments and congratulations. Thank you. Pleasure, sir. What a pleasure, pleasure. talking to you. Pleasure, sir. Thank you. Bixthang Heritage Farmhouse is a 300-year-old heritage property with an ancient history that is growing into a popular tourist destination. Situated deep in Western Sikkim, Bixthang is a five-hour drive either from Gangtok or from the closest airport at Bagdogra. My name is Diki Yangchen. I run this homestay in a remote corner in West Sikkim, Bixthang Heritage Farmhouse. I'm the 14th generation in Sikkim, so I decided to move back to my ancestral property and uh, start something here. So my basic idea was uh, to revive agriculture because I think all heritages throughout the world, the common link between all of us is agriculture. A lot of our agricultural land is lying fallow because most of our spring waters were drying up. So what I decided to do is move back here but at the same time, try and you know, revive whatever agriculture that we could. Started building cottages so that I could run it together. Since I only have cottages that are ethnically and traditionally built, you know. So uh, our traditional style of building is, makes a lot of sense for the Himalayan mountains, you know, because it's a very seismic zone. So what we do is we have light structures on top and uh, it's mostly wooden. I've uh, strategically placed the cottages in agricultural wastelands. So either in places where uh, yeah, it was too rocky to do any agriculture or like in these bends where there was not enough like sun or like between bamboo grooves, you know. But it worked out for me because here what I can offer is the privacy, the space, the time. You feel like it's your own house once you come here. I guess it's like a blend of like offering all the amenities of a modern resort with the warmth of homes too. Rikstang is a tourism destination, you know. It's not a stopgap between your two places where you want to travel. So those who want to really understand what Sikkim is about, the authenticity of it, yeah, it's that kind of people that are, we are interested to, in catering to also. I'm taking you to Onku, which means a pond in Lhoke. I'm we're going to the pool now, the infinity pool, the first of its kind in Sikkim. <laughs> this is all cardamom, large cardamom here. This is guava. There's some original Sikkimese mandarin here. Zenga. 
a star of the five peaks, also revered as our guardian deity, Kanchan Zenga, right there. And in early mornings, especially during the winters and during the season time, you have the reflection of the mountains, like in the morning you must have seen, directly on the pool. Jira or the bar here. The pool bar. This is the spa, the menchu. Men means uh, medicine in Loke, Butia, and Chu means water. So this is medicinal water. The spa is called Menchu. Yeah, now I'm taking you to the traditional hot stone bath. This is where we normally offer the traditional hot stone bath. The idea is to keep yourself hydrated throughout. We still use wood, right? In the old days, it used to be one whole big tree trunk that's scooped out, and then you, you, you put the these are like actual stones that are heated and put it into the hot stone and then the, the stones heat up the water then we add the herbs the herbs that are cooked in the water to a certain degree you know this is a traditional thing that uh, the Sikkimese people are known to have done but I don't think uh, anywhere else in Sikkim we have something that's traditionally still maintained and still practiced it takes a lot of hours it takes it's a very laborious process and we do not preheat the water so there's no geysers around here and one way a guest can tell whether the water has been preheated or not when the stones heat up the water the water doesn't cool down at all it remains hot throughout so you can stay in for about an hour two hours whatever your intake is you know there's some people who can barely stay for about 10 10 minutes there's some people who can stay for about two hours three hours so we don't have any fixed timing for this it's up to the guest and up to the individual yeah. Bikstang um, in Meri or in Lepcha, it means uh, a place where the tiger killed a cow, Big Mon. And in Hloke or uh, Butia, it means a place with a wide variety of special stones. This is called the Gomjor, the entrance to the main house. And we're going into the dining or the Dunga. All old traditional Sikkimese houses were built something like this. You have like just one uh, big wooden pillar holding up the whole house. Then you have uh, walls, uh, wood stone walls that are about three feet in thickness. We're now entering the living area. This is my great grandfather who translated the history of Sikkim by Maharani Ishe Doma. Uh, 1908. He was also the teacher of the Sotashi Namgyal, the 11th king of uh, Sikkim. The queen, when she visited the cave in uh, Raune, or the cave down there in 1940, my grandfather had gone to receive her. Those are paintings by my great grandfather. The Lhansi Monastery, which was built in 1850, is a branch of the Sangchen Pema Yangtze Monastery. One thing that is very special about the Pema Yangtze Monastery, of which Lhansi Gumba is a branch of, is that uh, the monks of Pema Yangtze are supposed to be of pure breed. They are supposed to be Tasangs, you know. They are the only monks who are allowed to coronate the kings of Sikkim. It is a very significant monastery and very unique to Sikkim. And uh, we are one of the branches of the monastery of uh, Pema Yangtze in Peling. There are three ethnic communities in Sikkim. The Marys or the Lepchas, the Lhopos or the Bhutias, and the Nepalese. Indigenously, uh, the Lepchas were here much before any other uh, community was here. If you really look at it, the Lepchas are believed to be the original inhabitants of the land, which was not uh, demarcated into Sikkim. All the demarcation and the actual setting was after the monarchy came. So because of Big Stang Heritage Farmhouse, I've uh, 
been invited to lots of conferences and you know places like Delhi, Guwahati, you know even uh, different colleges to speak about uh, certain issues. Now I noticed that when I go to mainland India, first of all I look different, you know, so it takes a long time to convince them that we are Indians, <laughs> you know, that we are part of India now. The last uh, conference that I attended in Delhi is not a conference, but it was a full fellowship program that I attended. And I was trying to convince them, let's do something about bridging the gap between mainland India and the Northeast. For starts, let's put our history into the syllabuses of different schools so that there's more reach. There's so less that is being said about us. If you want an integrated India, I think it's important to have the history so that we, we know a little bit about, you know, each other. We know the history of India like <laughs> like the back of hands and the world history. I'd rather come from a small place and know about the world than come from a big place, a first developed country, like you know, first world country and know nothing about the rest of the world. I feel very fortunate that way, you know. It's almost winter now. It has been a long and incredible journey, eye-opening, humbling and heartwarming. A learning experience to meet the people, local communities, especially the youths, the guardians of this ancient history, indigenous knowledge, culture and their rich natural environment. I leave the northeast of India with a strong feeling of hope, hope that the future will be safe and secure. For travelers and people like me to come back and discover for themselves this unique part of India.